have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, Glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea. With a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. While God is marching on, glory, glory, hallelujah, glory, glory, hallelujah, glory. Hallelujah, His truth is marching on. Thank you, Brother Bo. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to the book of Colossians, chapter 4. Colossians, chapter 4, we're going to be looking at verses 2 through 4 this morning. And we're going to be talking about the matter of a productive and powerful prayer life. Colossians 4, beginning at verse 2, it says, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance 
<coughs> excuse me, to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may speak, or that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Heavenly Father, as we look into your word this morning, I pray you'll speak to us and speak to our hearts about this matter of prayer. Such an important thing in the life of any believer. Help us to understand just how to pray. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Now when you think about things in our Christian life as believers, things that are important, you will find from the book of Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation, there are many things of significance and importance to us as believers. One of those things is spending time in the Word. The Word of God should be important to you. It should be important to me. In fact, the Bible tells us in the book of Psalms, 119 verse 115, that the Bible is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. It gives us instructions. We're told to follow those instructions on a daily basis. It gives us direction. It also gives us power. It says in Psalm 119 verse 11, I have hid thy word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You know this book gives you the ability and the power to recognize sin and overcome it. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. And it's something that sustains us as believers. We're told that we are to meditate on the Word of God day and night. And the idea is like a cow chewing its cud. You know what? You eat the Word of God, the bread of life, and you chew on it. And you constantly chew on it and regurgitate it and chew on it. I know it doesn't sound nice, but the idea is it becomes a part of you. There's no greater thing to know when you're out there, whether you have a hard copy of the Bible or not, or whether you have a on your phone. Maybe you don't have any of those things. And you need scripture. But because it's in your heart, because it's something that made a part of you, you're able to bring it to mind. Maybe there's a friend that has a need. They're going through a hard time. And they just need a word of encouragement. And you can say, the Bible says. Or maybe there's something that you're facing and you feel all alone. And it comes to mind where Jesus said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. The Word of God. You realize that during the Vietnam War, at the Hanoi Hotel in Vietnam, our prisoners of wars sustained themselves by exchanging scripture verses. They did it with doing Morse code. They were tapping out scripture verses to one another to encourage them. Well, you can't do that if you don't make the word of God important in your life. How many times I hear people say, well, the Bible says this or the Bible says that. And it's nowhere to be found in the Bible. You know where they heard it somewhere. Where someone says, this is what the Bible says. No, that's not in the Bible. That's just an old saying. This is what the Bible says. Make it a part of your life. It's important. But just as important as the Word of God is, so is prayer. Prayer is such a beautiful, wonderful thing. It has got such power. And it can be so purposeful. It can have productivity in your lives. If it's used the right way. You realize that prayer is a gift. It's a gift from God. And it's a gift that should be used. And a lot of people have the wrong idea when it comes to the matter of prayer. Prayer is not just a bunch of formal recitations. And what I mean is it's it's not about saying a formalized prayer. Now I know that there are some denominations and other beliefs, they like to quote the Lord's Prayer. 
Now that's the model prayer for all of us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And I'm not taking away from that. It's biblical. It's in here. But that is a model prayer that the Lord gives to us. But it's more than about just repeating a bunch of words. See, a lot of times I've seen people that would just go through the motions of saying the words and they never thought about the words. There was no head connection. There was no heart connection. It's just what you do. Prayer is much more than just reciting certain things that you hear in church. I've heard people say at times, time, times it hurts, they'll be up there and have these nice flowery prayers. And they get up there, oh, heavenly Father, thou divine, and they go on and on and on and on, trying to impress other people. And then other people will be out there hearing and they get called on to pray. And you know what? They start imitating the person they just heard. There. Oh, man, that was a great prayer. You know what prayer is? Prayer is not about the words that you say. Prayer is not about this formal format that you put those words into. It's a communication between you and God. It's talking to God. But it's more than just a communication. It's a communion with God. It's a time of communion. When you come together, and the idea of a communion is this, you pour out your deepest most intimate thoughts with God. Isn't that amazing? See, there's sometimes you can't be in communion with other people. You don't share your deepest thoughts. You don't share your heart with other people. Sometimes they might get offended. Sometimes they might take it the wrong way. Sometimes they may not understand. God says, you can tell me anything. I want to hear from you. It's that intimacy. Now guys, you have to admit, you'll share some things with your wife you would never admit and share with anybody else. Your hopes, your fears. And ladies, you do the same thing with your husband. You may share certain things with your husband that you would never share with anybody else. Not even your own children. Because you have that level of intimacy in the husband and wife relationship. That closeness. But it's more than communion. Prayer is also an invitation. See, when we go to pray, we are entering the presence of God himself. We are entering the throne room, if you will. And we're inviting God's presence into our lives. God, I need you. I need your wisdom. Please come and speak to me. Prayer is such a wonderful, wonderful thing. The problem with prayer is that all too many don't pray. They don't use prayer properly. Our prayers become ineffective. There's no power in our prayer. But we are reminded over and over and over again all throughout the Bible how important prayer should be just like the word of God it should be a part of us of who we are prayer shouldn't be something that we just pull out when we need it break the glass in emergency prayer should be a part of us now if you and I want to have an effective powerful productive prayer life there's certain things that are elementary to that process. Paul gives us three things here this morning. And I just want to share with him, with you this morning. Three things. Three elements of a productive, powerful prayer life. Number one, our prayer should be consistent. Consistent. He says, continue in prayer. Verse 2, continue in prayer. In other words, don't stop praying. Now I know it's easy sometimes to just quit. Sometimes it's easier to quit than it is to keep going, isn't it? You get tired. You get worn out. 
sometimes the road and the traveler gets tough. It's like, I can't do this anymore. I quit. I'll be honest with you this morning. I've had many times where I've had responsibilities given to me within the church. I remember years ago, I was asked to take on the teens. And I did that. I thought, this is going to be great. This is going to be awesome. I'm not an old fogey. I'm one of these young people. This will be great. It was a disaster. It was horrible. It was horrible for the teens. It was horrible for me. Because that's not where God wanted me. But I did not quit. We had someone else that came in. And I don't want to say I was removed, but I was found. There was another place for me in ministry. Because we realized, myself, I was taught with Pastor Boofer, this is not a good fit. So let's transition you over here. So I was moved to the young married class. And I was like, we had uh, 20 people in there. It was good. I knew the people. And all of a sudden, it started dropping off. Because the one who had taught the class before, Ron Swain, started another class. People started migrating back in because they were used to Ron. And it ended up, I had one person in my class. And it wasn't even my wife. Somebody else. My wife was teaching another class at the time. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, and you know what I said? That's it. I quit. So I quit the class. So I'm not going to do it anymore. What's the point? There's nobody here. I think it would be best if I just stepped down. That's one of the biggest regrets I've had in the church. See, I didn't do anything to try to build the class. I didn't pray about it. I didn't work to build it. I just quit because that was easy. And then I was asked to take on the adult Bible class. And I said, I don't want to do that. But I've done it. And guess what? I've been doing it for 20-something years. And there's been times I had one person in the class and I could have easily said, I quit. But I said, the Lord will show me, you don't quit. And it's the same with our prayer life. Don't quit. Just because God doesn't answer your prayer right away doesn't mean God's saying no. God's just saying, keep on praying. Continue in prayer. Prayer is a gift. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17 tells us that we are to pray without ceasing. And when the early church came together, if you read the book of Acts chapter 1, verse 14, it says, they came together, and what did they do? They prayed. But it wasn't just a one-off situation, if you will. They didn't just pray one time and forget about it. If you read down in verse 42, they continued to pray for the church, for the needs and guess what? God heard and answered to the prayers and he added to the church daily those that should be saved. They had powerful prayer. They had productive prayer because they continued in prayer. See, prayer is not something that's to be an occasional event. It's not. And I hate to say it, Sadly, in the church, among believers, you will find people who pray occasionally, if at all. Now, when I say occasionally, they pray when a need arises. Everything's going good. They don't pray. They don't even give a second thought to God. But then suddenly, a crisis comes up. And what do they do? They run to their knees. They run, they fall, and they say, Lord, help me. Help me. I need you, Lord. Fix my problems. That's it. And as soon as the problem's fixed, and the Lord intercedes, you know what they do? They stop praying. Until the next crisis comes. But not only that, 
sometimes we pray, but we do not pray correctly. Because what we do, we just go through the motions. I said before, we go through the motions of prayer. Oh, we may say grace. We may say, now I lay me down to sleep. We might say all of those things. But it's not from the heart. It's just going through the motions of prayer. And we do that not because we want to talk to God. We want to do it so we can feel better about ourselves. Did you pray today? Oh, yes, I did. I said, Lord, bless this food. Amen. Oh, Lord, help my family. Amen. Lord, bless all our missionaries. Amen. Lord, bless the church. Amen. We say these little cursory prayers. These flippant insignificant prayer so we can say yeah I did it's like when we read our Bible we go through and we go da, 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 read my Bible well, what did that you read one what did that verse say I don't know I don't know what did the Lord have to say to you through that verse I don't know I just read it though it was something about sin it was something about Jesus. So you can't go wrong when you start talking about the Word of God or being in church. What did you learn today? I learned about sin. I talked about Jesus. You can't go wrong with that, right? But we don't get the deeper meanings of what is being talked to us. We don't talk to God in a way that God can relate to us. You understand, communion is you speaking to God from your heart and allowing God to speak to you from His heart. That's the great thing about prayer. And we talk about, it says, pray without ceasing, continue in prayer. Now, the idea of this is not that we should be walking around 24 hours a day, seven days a week, mumbling prayers underneath our breath. It means that we are to be in a constant mode of prayer. In other words, Prayer should become second nature to us. It should become a part of us. We should do it without even having to think about it. It should be no different than breathing or eating. You get hungry, what do you do? You eat. You feel those hunger pains and you want something to eat. You go out, now you may have to think about what you want to eat. But it's no different in prayer. You have something, you feel that grumbling, you know you need to be praying. Well, what do I pray about? Well, if you're going to eat, maybe you're in the mood for Chinese, maybe you're in the mood for Mexican, maybe you're in the mood for Italian, whatever, and you decide on what you need. Well, sometimes you may need to pray about your missionaries. Sometimes you may need to pray about your problems. Sometimes you may need to be a pray about your church. Sometimes you may need to be praying about other people's needs. You get the idea. Prayer doesn't have to be, I have to pray this way every single day. Prayer is about just talking to God about what's on your heart. That can change, just like your diet can change. But you still have to eat in order to survive. And as believers, we've got to pray if we want to survive spiritually. But think about it this way too. Breathing. When's the last time you thought about breathing? You don't think about it, do you? You don't sit there and go, I'm breathing. No. You don't count the breath. You just do it. It's a part of us. And if somebody tries to cut off your breathing, what do you do? You're going to fight tooth and nail to restore that oxygen that you're taking in. That's the way prayer ought to be in our lives as believers. It just becomes something that we do. It's a part of us. And if somebody tries to take your prayer life away, you're going to fight tooth and nail to restore it. It's part of us. See, that's the power of prayer. It becomes second nature. It's one of those things, when you wake up, you say, well, am I going to pray today? You shouldn't have to think about it. Yes, you're going to pray. You wake up in the morning, you start to get out of bed. The first thing you do is you say, Lord, thank you for this day. You're going through the day. Lord, thank you for not letting that car run into me as I was driving down the road. Lord, thank you for the price of gas dropping. Lord, thank you for this. Or Lord, thank you for that. 
Lord, thank you for your many blessings. Lord, I saw this person. They looked like they had an issue. Help them. That's the idea. And the idea of being constantly in prayer does not mean that you bombard or try to overwhelm the Lord with your request. Now you say, what do you mean by that? Okay. Understand this. The Lord wants to hear from you. He desires to hear your request. The book of James tells us we have not because we ask not. Amen. He wants us to ask. He's concerned about us. He knows our needs before we do. But he still wants us to ask. But that doesn't mean you have to sit there and say, Lord, help me, 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 help me. My youngest daughter, Tina, when she was little, we'd be driving down the road and she'd get thirsty. And she'd say, Daddy, I'm thirsty. Okay, well, when we get to where we're going, we're almost there, we'll get, I'll get you something to drink. Then it would be, I'm thirsty. I heard you. I'm thirsty. I heard you. I'm thirsty, 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 and just continue on until either one or two things happen. You say, if you say another word, you're not going to get anything to drink, period. Or you couldn't take it anymore and you pulled off the side of the road and you got her something to drink just to get her to be quiet. You get it? Well, see, that's the way we treat God sometimes. Right? We pray and we think, if I just keep bugging God, oh Lord, I need this, 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 that God will just say, okay, here, stop bugging me. Well, give me a little on a little secret here. You can't overwhelm God. You can ask as many times as you want. You can't overwhelm him. You realize that every single one of us could be praying at the same time and God hears every single prayer individually and knows exactly what you said. He's not overwhelmed by it. If every Christian on the face of the earth prayed at the exact same time and were praying all these different prayers in different languages, God would hear each prayer individually and understand them all. You can't overwhelm him. Period. But for us to sit there and just ask for our needs over and over and over and over and over again without even allowing God a chance to answer it's just downright being selfish. I'll just be honest with you. It's being selfish and disrespectful. God is a God almighty. He wants to hear from you. But he doesn't want us to be pestering him. Now that doesn't mean that when God delays his answer, that the answer is no. And he doesn't mean that, oh, you can only pray for something once. No, he wants you to continue in prayer, but he wants you and I to wait patiently and continuing to pray and just trust him. Not be annoying. Amen. Now you can pray for something every day. You can pray for the same thing every day. I've known people that have had lost loved ones and they pray for them every single day for their salvation. I had a brother that I prayed for for 30 years for salvation who finally got saved. See, that's being consistent. Lord, meet this need. But I didn't sit here for 24 hours and say, Lord, save him, save him, save him, save him, save him, save him, save him. You get it? That means we're trying to force God to do what we want. That's not the way God works. So we need to be consistent in our prayer. And you realize that sometimes when God says you need to wait, it's not a denial, but it's God saying this. Continue in prayer. And the more you continue in prayer, it will better prepare you to accept God's answer as his will. See, the more you pray about it, you might understand I want this, but is this God's will or is it not God's will? The more we pray, the more God speaks to us and we understand better why God's allowing us to wait. I went through something a few few months ago. I was praying. I had a need. And I said, Lord, I need this. I need your answer. I didn't get an answer. And it went on and on and on. And I continued to pray about it. 
And I couldn't understand why, Lord, you're not just answering this now. But then the Lord finally answered that prayer. And he answered it in a way I didn't expect. He met the need that I had in his time. And it helped me to understand he's always there right when we need him. Not in my time, but his time. And not in the way I want things done, but in his way. And I couldn't, tell, I could, I couldn't help but just say, thank you, praise God. Not because I got what I wanted, but how God did it. See, if God done it the way I wanted, I would have been going, see, I did this. Instead of God did this. Amen. So our prayer needs to be consistent. But then we look at the second thing in verse 2. He says, and watch. We need to be alert when we pray. When we pray and we ask God for something, we need to be watching and looking for God's response. We need to be on the alert. How many times have you prayed? Have I prayed? And we never really expected God to do anything. Sometimes maybe you have prayed like this. You've said, Lord, I have this need. I'm not deserving. I don't expect you to do anything, but here it is. Wow. You have not because you asked not. You know, that's not even really, I, I don't deserve it. No, you know what? Just go ahead and keep it. That's kind of the way it comes across, doesn't it? I don't really expect God to answer it. You know what? We were told in the book of James to say, you ask and you receive not because you ask amiss. We don't ask correctly. He also tells us in the book of James chapter 1, it says, when you ask something of God, do it in faith. Nothing wavering. You know, when I go and I pray, I expect God to answer my prayer. Now, it may not, again, be the way I, ex I, I want it. But I expect God to answer my prayer. Can I give you a very personal example? Back in 2020, my daughter got sick. She got COVID. And she went in the hospital. She went in the hospital on a Wednesday night and she never came home. The entire time she was in the hospital, I prayed, Lord, bring her home. Bring her home. Bring her back to her daughter. Bring her back to us. Give healing to her. And I never doubted that God was going to heal her. Never. I said, God's going to answer this prayer. Well, two weeks after she went in the hospital, she went home to be with the Lord. See, God brought her home. She's with family. He just didn't bring her home to us. So God's answer was no. That was tough. Was it because I didn't have enough faith? No. It was because God had other plans. And I had to accept God's will. It was tough. It was hard. But God answered my prayer. She's not suffering. She's not hurting. You know where she's at today? She's in her heavenly home. Oh, I wouldn't even ask her to come back. Do I miss her? Sure. Does her daughter miss her? Yes, we all miss her. But she's in a far better place. And while we may hurt, I kept looking for God to do something and watching and waiting. It may not have been what I wanted, but God is good. And we need to be looking for God's answers when we pray. The problem is sometimes when we pray, we don't look. We don't expect God to do anything or we don't look for the answer. And sometimes they're right in front of us. Have you ever prayed and said, Lord, I need something. I need you to do something. Show me something. And you start reading the Word of God and all of a sudden, that's the answer. Right there. Or somebody comes along your path and they say something to you and say, thank you, Lord, that's the answer. Well, sometimes it works that way, but sometimes we look so hard, we can't see the obvious that's right in front of our face. You ever lost anything 
and you've looked so hard for it, you tore the house apart and you just can't find it, only to find out it was right in front of you the whole time. I was at the home one time and I was sitting there having my, my glasses up here like this and I was walking, where are my glasses? I couldn't find my glasses. I'm tearing the place apart. Look at my daughter. She goes, what's on your head? What? There they are. Don't I feel silly, right? Sometimes the answers are right there, but we just don't see it because we're trying and looking too hard. Well, see, that's something that we treat God that way. We pray and we say, God, answer my prayer. And then we expect some crazy miracle to take place. When God's answer is something simple, it's right here in front of us. We expect something supernatural. But God says the answer is here. There's an old story about a guy who lived in a house. It was right by the river. And it started raining and the water started rising. There was a flood. He had to climb up at his house. He ended up getting his out. The water kept rising. He ends up getting on his roof. And the water's still rising. And he starts crying out to God, God, help me, save me. Please. About that time, a canoe comes by. A couple of guys paddle on the canoe. And they look up, hey, come on down. We'll get you in the boat and we'll take you to safety. No, no, that's all right. I'm waiting on God. A little bit later, as the waters continued to rise, there was a motorboat that came by. The guy said, hey, come on down there. Get in the boat. We'll take you to safety. He said, no, no, no. I'm waiting on God. Pretty soon the waters are getting even higher and higher. And there's a helicopter that comes by. And the guy gets on the bullhorn. He drops down the ladder. He says, hey, man, climb up the ladder. We'll take you to safety. He said, no, no, that's all right. I'm waiting on God. And the waters continue to rise. And they overtake the man. And he drowns and he dies. And he gets to heaven. And he stands before the Lord. And he said, Lord. I prayed and I asked you to do something to save me and you let me drown. He said, I sent you a canoe. I sent you a boat and a helicopter. What more do you want? See, the idea is God can answer our prayer, but we don't look for the answers. When's the last time you prayed and said, Lord, open a door for me to witness. And then the Lord opens that door and you didn't even pay attention. You walked right by it. When's the last time you asked God to do something and you walked right by the answer? We need to be watching, looking, and we need to be consistent in our prayer. And then we get to the last element, and that's thankfulness. He says, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Thankfulness is an important ingredient when it comes to the matter of prayer. Philippians 4 chapter 6, or Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving that your requests be made known unto God. You know, when we continually ask God to do things in our lives, and we never show an ounce of gratitude, it exposes our selfish nature. It says, this is all about me. Never saying thank you. Never saying anything of gratitude. I was with my granddaughter the other day, and I've tried to teach my granddaughter always to be grateful for the things that she's been blessed with. But she's nine years old. And when you're nine years old, you don't always think like that, do you? And the other day she was complaining about something. No one ever, nobody ever, no one cares about me. Blah, blah, you know how it is. I said, that's not true. Say, so all I want is this, and all I want is that, and all I want is this. I said, you see, you keep asking and asking and asking. But you never say thank you for what you're giving. That's wrong. Now, she does say, thank you for this and that, but the example is this. We go to God and we say, God, I need, help me, do this. When's the last time you just went to God and you didn't ask for anything? You just want to say, thank you. 
Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for the roof over my head. Thank you for the food on my table, the clothes on my back. Thank you for the health that you've given me. Hey, you may not be in the best of health, but you're still alive and kicking, aren't you? You may have your aches and pains, but God's still allowing you to go on. He's giving you time with your family. He's giving you time with your friends. It's easy to get caught up on the circumstances and to focus on that. And it's hard to be thankful when your circumstances are trying. But I know you've heard it before, and I'll just remind you again. When you're facing those trying circumstances, if you would just take the time to stop and reflect on the blessings of God, your circumstances may not change, but you know what? Your outlook will. God is so good. We have so much to be thankful for. Again, I think about my daughter. Yeah, she was taken from us at the year of or 20 years, 28 years of age. Whole life's ahead of her. And yeah, she drove me crazy from time to time. My granddaughter's a spitting image of her. Amen. But she's my little Kayla. She really is. So Kayla still lives on through my granddaughter. But we had 28 years with her. Now think about this. If you were in prison for 28 years, you know, that's my whole life. But when it comes to a, dealing with it, well, that's nothing. We had 28 years. But you know what? We're going to have an eternity together as well. And while I don't want to see her go, I did want to see her go. I miss her every day. I think about her every day. We have a pillow in our room. It's got her face on it. And it's, somebody give it to my wife. And it says, if you're feeling down or blue, it's like doctor or whatever says, this is your prescription. It's a hug. Hug the pillow. And I saw this pillow in the, last night before I was going to bed. And she's just got this little smile on her face. And I just looked at the pillow and said, I love you. I miss you. I am so thankful that she was a part of my life. I'm so thankful for that child she brought in my life. She made me a better person. A better father. See, I made mistakes with the first one, so I got better with her. Amen. By the third one time, the, by the third one time, the, the third one came along. I was just too tired and worn out. I didn't make any matter. But anyway, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But we have so much to be thankful for. I had a tree fall on my house two weeks ago. It's still there, by the way. Trying to get it off this week. First thing I didn't say was, "Oh Lord," and I said, "Lord, thank you." No one got hurt. My house didn't get major damage but importantly nobody in my family got hurt so even when the circumstances are trying you can be thankful you just got to look for it amen so I close with this if you and I want to have a productive and powerful prayer life we must be consistent in our prayer in other words we pray and we don't stop we don't quit there's an old saying if you don't use it, you lose it. If you want to lose the power of prayer, just stop doing it. If you want to gain the power, you keep doing it. And then we need to be watching and waiting and looking for God's answer. And then we need to be thankful. And most importantly, be thankful even when the answer may be no. All right, would you stand with me? I want to say thank you for being here this morning. I hope this message was an encouragement to you. I know it was to me. We all need a reminder sometimes about the importance of prayer. I hope you'll be back on Wednesday night when we get to our midweek prayer service. We're going to be talking about are you profitable or unprofitable. We'll look at the parable of the talents on Wednesday night. Be back next week on our Sunday school at 10 o'clock. We'll be getting into the book of Zechariah as 
we can go back to studying the minor prophets and then be back here next Sunday morning again at 10 or 11 o'clock. And we're going to continue with the idea of prayer, but we're going to talk about the importance of praying for others next week. And we continue preaching through the book of Colossians. I hope you'll be praying for each other through the week. And I hope you have a very, very good week. Stay out of the heat. Amen. All right, let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for this young lady who came to visit with us this morning. We pray you'll bless her. We pray you'll bless the families of each and every person here. I know that there's many that are going through some difficult times. We pray for Miss Patchy's husband, Edison, that you would be with him and be with the family. I pray for Miss Monica as she's recovering from this sprained wrist. I pray for Miss Betty as she's recovering from this car accident. Others that are in need of your healing hands upon them. I pray that you will bless them and be with them. I pray you'll help us as we go forward in the days ahead to stay united as a church. Satan will do anything he can to separate us and tear us apart. Help us to be focused on Jesus. Help us to share the gospel. Help us to be a light in this community. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Y'all have a good afternoon.